thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Peter. Um, I'm hoping that you're still awake. This is the post-lunch crowd. I'm aware of that. Um, I'm this guy on Twitter. Uh, even though my nickname is actually 23 years old, I was very late to Twitter, so I have the underscores. I work at a company called Citrix uh, in uh, Copenhagen on a product called Podio, where I'm the front-end lead. So very short uh, for the history buffs among you, Podio is sort of like hypercard for the web, software as a service thing, and then plus a bit of collaboration on top of that. Um, I have also been a, an organizer of Copenhagen JS for a couple of years. Uh, yeah, some of you might recognize yourself actually on this uh, on this image. You want to leave it there for a minute? <laughs> Great. <laughs> And if you've ever heard about me uh, from, uh, from the open source circle, you might have heard of my project called Asset Graph, uh, which is yet another build tool, um, I think, with a different approach. And I can't stop talking about it. So if you want to learn about this, poke me in, in one of the breaks and find me. Um, this is yet another build tooling talk, but this one is specific to transpilers. So in case you don't know what a transpiler is, it is a compiler that instead of compiling source code into machine code, it compiles source code into a different type of source code. So in this case, on your right-hand side, yes, on your right-hand side, which is over here for you, yes, <laughs> is the machine code, which in our case is CSS, HTML, JavaScript, and things like that. Uh, on the left hand, which is really confusing when it's opposite, you have the source code that you would like to write. This is your ES6, this is your SAS and less and stuff like that. So any time in this talk when I mention a transpiler or transpiling, you can substitute for any of these in your mind. SAS, less stylus, auto prefixer, myth, babel, coffee script, typescript, markdown, or whatever. Odds are some of you have used one of these. Um, so these are all transpilers. Um, so this talk is about uh, why transpiling is a problem. I don't have a problem with transpilers themselves. Transpilers are really awesome Unix-type tools which take uh, one or more inputs and give you one output, and that is actually really simple and really good. The problem I have is with one of the side effects that come with some of the build systems that people use when they uh, integrate transpilers into their workflows. And the primary uh, culprit here is the build artifact. So the build artifact is the thing that your browser consumes or that other tools consume. So this is, again, your CSS, your JavaScript, your HTML. Build artifacts have a transient nature. Um, they're not the thing we're actually interested in, but they're the thing that we need to produce in order for the machine to understand what we're doing. Um, so this means that we want build artifacts, but primarily for consumption, we're not really interested in storing them until we actually want to deploy our, our websites. Um, so this gives us a weird duality and actually gives us some problems with, uh, with workflow setups. And uh, let's do a workflow setup of a project right now so I can show you why this is complex. So first of all, the simplest possible way you can do transpiling is you transpile your source code into the, the target code uh, in the same directory. They're sibling files, right? So in this case, you have your main SAS file, which gets compiled into your main CSS file. It's a sibling. It's kind of easy to understand. You kind of know where to find your code. So we're not interested in the build artifacts. So let's uh, add an ignore for our for CSS files in our source directory so we don't version control them anymore. This is what most, uh, most people do. That's easy to, to maintain. But now the first problem arrives, because eventually, because the code that we produce as build artifacts is the same code that we might also write in other cases, you might have other CSS files in your, in your directory, in your source directory. These might also be JavaScript files. It's completely valid to have files of the extension that the browser consumes in your source directory. So if you start ignoring them, you're in a world of pain. So we don't do this. This is a bad idea. So what most people have come up with is a setup where you have your app and your main SAS file, and you compile into a directory called artifacts, or temp. I think most people use underscore temp or whatever in Yeoman setups, at least. 
and then your main CSS resides here. And then you can very easily uh, ignore from version control all your build artifacts because you simply ignore the folder where they exist. This is pretty nice. But now your URLs are sort of broken because the source code is not actually where you expect it to be. It's in a different directory. It might even be in a directory which is outside of your web root. So in order to deal with this, people have come up with this nice setup where you can add a piece of middleware to your web server, and this middleware will know about the existence of the build artifacts in a different directory. So in the first HTTP get, we see that uh, the web server is looking for main.css in the artifacts directory, and then it's looking for index.html in the artifacts directory, but it doesn't find it because index.html might not actually be a transpiled uh, build artifact. So when it gets a 404, it falls back to your original source directory, and then it gets a correct hit on index.html. So now you have a piece of middleware that needs to know something about your workflow setup. So next of all, you probably want to somehow trigger your builds. It gets kind of tedious to manually run these tasks, just as you don't like refreshing your browser. You probably don't like running make or grunt or whatever you use. So Usually, people set up file watching, so they watch all the CSS files, in, uh, all, the, all the SAS files, it should have been, in, uh, in their source directory. And whenever uh, you have a source file increment, whenever you make a change, uh, you trigger the transpile task that we set up just before, and then you get your updated build artifact. And while we're at it, usually people set up live reloading, so whenever the build artifact gets updated, the browser will also update, so you can see your changes. This is pretty nice, but in order to orchestrate all of this, now you have a task, now you have a web server that needs to know about things, now you have a file watcher and you have a live reloader. This is a lot to do manually, so you probably want to have some sort of task runner to orchestrate all of these things at the same time. So People in here have probably uh, used at some point in time, grunt, uh, gulp, broccoli, make even. Um, so you can do that. And that's, that's about it right? For, for a workflow setup for CSS. But these days, we're not only transpiling CSS. We're also transpiling JavaScript. And JavaScript is, is consumed by more consumers than just the browser or your build system. So suddenly, we need to also think about how does this build artifact integrate, or how does my workflow tooling integrate with all of the other consumers of my build artifacts? How does the task runner understand ES6? How does my production bundler uh, understand ES6? How does the linter understand it? How does it, my test framework understand it? And the solution for, for these are usually, oh, you just have each of these tools implement a plugin framework. So you can use a Babel plugin for your linter and for your middleware and for your task runner and for your production bundler and for your test framework and for your module loader and for anything else that might be touching your source code. And you need each of, uh, a plugin for each of these for each of the types of languages you want to transpile. So just start multiplying the amount of plugins you need. So some people think this is OK. The word I use for it is complex. I think this is way too complex. Um, but don't worry. There's a solution for, for this complexity. Uh, obviously, you don't want to set up a system like this by hand every time you create a new project. So we simply say, oh, that we can just auto-generate it, right? And then it's easy, because I only need to run one command. But this is easy. It's not simple. It's, it's easy, but creates a lot of complexity. And the problem is, when anything goes wrong in this setup, imagine you're a newbie, and you're sitting in a Coda dojo, and your mentor told you to run your web app, and then something goes wrong. And all you see is this. And your first question is, how does it work? Why is it even set up in that way? You might have been able to follow me right here because you've all done this before. You've all felt the pain. You kind of understand which, which moving parts are, are here. But a newbie doesn't. Um, and I think this is a big problem. And whenever I say that, that our workflow tooling is complex, there's always at least one person in the room that says, oh, you know, Peter, um, my setup is special. My setup has legacy. My setup has complexity. So we need this complexity needed. 
I, will, I promised uh, Peter Fantasy to say, the people who say this, they're doing it wrong. You are doing it wrong if you ever said this. You need complexity. You don't need complexity. You need ability, right? The ability is what your tools are supposed to give you. They're not supposed to give you complexity. The ideal tool gives you maximum ability and minimum complexity, also called simplicity. So what we should strive for is to build tools that are simple. So let's figure out what these moving parts are, what are the important attributes of transpiling that we actually want in order to gain this ability, and then recompose them in a way so we can actually gain this ability with minimum complexity overhead, so that newbies are actually able to say, I want to use a transpiler, but I don't want to buy into a massive ecosystem. I just want this one ability to transpile and nothing else. Maybe I don't even want a web server. So the uh, things I've come up with, this might not be, the, be a complete list. Some of these might also not necessarily have to be there, but it's a good guideline, right? I think that in order to avoid this idiocy of having a million transpiler plugins for everything, we should figure out a way to have a tool that can actually just handle all types of transpilers. Let's figure out how to unify that a single tool can actually transpile more than one thing, right? Then we can clean up half of NPM. We don't need uh, Grunt and Gulp, SAS plugins, and Babel plugins. Like, we don't need that anymore. Let's figure out how to do this. It needs a good API. It needs to be able to integrate with other tools. Um, the best API I can come up with is a file system, um, because uh, any tool can interact with a file system. Um, it should be standalone and shouldn't impose a big, uh, nasty ecosystem on you. And I think it should be doing on-demand transpilation. So some task runners are actually not doing, doing that right now. I'm going to come back to that. I think it should keep URLs valid, because if you can trace a URL from, from your browser uh, down directly to your source code and find your files on disk, that makes everything more simple. I think it should be nice. It should have all the nice things that everybody wants to have, source maps, auto-prefixing, caching, and it should have little to no configuration. It should simply understand what needs to be done at the time you need it to be done. And with that also comes, there should be a simple mental model. If you cannot explain how this tool works within one or two sentences, then it's probably too much. So let's see how the current setups stack up. And I'm a bit critical here, so maybe, maybe more check marks are in order here. right? Task runners, they definitely handle all types of transpilers uh, with a lot of plugins, which I don't like, but they do it. Uh, they're nice. They give us source maps. They give us auto prefixing, uh, caching, and stuff like that. But some of them have a really, really horrible API, and most of them, actually. Um, they're definitely not standalone. They do, by their definition, impose an ecosystem that you have to work within. Uh, you cannot, like my linter uh, that, that runs on, on file systems, cannot consume a gulp stream. Um, usually, task runners actually transpile on file change, which means that they also change, uh, transpile things that you might actually not be using at the moment. That's a lot of wasted resource cycles right there. Uh, they don't keep URLs valid, if, uh, at least if you have a setup where, where you have your build artifacts in a, in a place outside of your web route. Um, they definitely have a lot of configuration. Like, that's the primary thing that these task runners have, and I don't think they're simple. Um, now, I don't want to hate on task runners. I think that task runners are actually uh, instrumental to getting us to where we are. I think they have created a very stable foundation to develop tools on, and I think we should thank them for that. But I also think that they have been an incremental optimization towards a local optimum. And I think that we can maybe do a leap and figure out if there's a more optimal way to, to, to do this. And uh, one of the concepts I've been thinking about is control flow with this. Most of these task runners are based on a control flow that, that says, whenever you change your source code, I'm doing some work, and then I might tell you about it. But it's actually possible to reverse this. There are a few uh, points in, uh, in this setup where you can actually hook in and do the opposite. 
you can figure out whenever somebody wants to consume an asset, and then you can intercept that, and then you can do something about it. So one of the things that I've been using, instead of using a task runner for transpiling, uh, is a piece of middleware. So this sits in my, my Express server. And uh, by having this ability of intercepting requests, it can obviously still, you can integrate all types of transpilers. You can transpile on demand. Whenever the request comes in, you can figure out, oh, that the browser wants this, so I'll, I'll just go fetch it, right? This also reduces the configuration, because I don't need to configure any path. The browser will tell me which path it wants, and I can read it from the file system here, do my changes, cache it, source map it, auto prefix it, and keep the URLs valid. Uh, and it's kind of simple to understand. It's a pipeline, and on the way through, some work is done, right? But it's missing some checkpoints. Um, not all of my tools are actually consuming HTTP. And that's a problem. So I still need to have all of these plugins for command line tools. Uh, and I still get all the complexity of having these plugins. Um, so I've thought a lot about this idea. And uh, last year, on, uh, on this very stage, actually, on, on this spot, uh, Matthias Booz was, was talking and demoing Wikipedia streamed in over torrent stuff. right? And he was using a technology which was really cool. Uh, and instead of explaining a lot about that, I'd like to actually jump into a demo and show you what I'm able to do by using this idea that he gave me. So I'll jump into my console. Is this a big enough text? Yes? Looks good. All right. Uh, I'm a newbie developer. I've just been at a Coda Dojo. Um, I was told that I need to uh, have a project directory. It's probably best to have a source folder. So I have a source folder with my awesome website. So it's really down to earth, hello world, uh, index HTML, stuff like that. So I can show you here, it looks like this. Right? It's hello.js.conf.eu, and it has a cat image, because every good website should have a cat image. And I can open this thing, and you can see it. Right? So this is, this is a good example of a starter website. I have a heading. I have written hello world. I've given it a color, so I'm able to interact with things. I have a cat image that's always good for learning, and I rotated it a bit. So again, I can see that I can interact with things. So one year later, I'm a slightly more experienced web developer, and now I'm ready to take on the concept of an abstraction. So um, what I would like to do is I would, be, you know, I would like to be able to abstract um, my color into a variable. So I. Ask someone, and everybody in the room here will probably say, oh, you need SAS. OK, so I will, I will use SAS. So I will edit my source file, my main CSS file. I thought I would open it. There we go. All right, so I've already prepared a bit because I'm really, really bad at live coding. So I create this color variable. It has a different color. It's no longer Rebecca purple. It is hot pink, which is a bit closer to the JSConf EU color. And uh, now the heading should be hot pink, right? But there's one more thing, thing I need to do in order to make this SAS. I need to move my file from source main.css to source main.scss. So now it's a SAS file, right? Um, which also means that when I reload my page, obviously it doesn't work. In this case, it doesn't work because I just moved the file and it actually doesn't see the file at all. So now I'm ready to integrate my transpiler, right? So uh, this is where I have a tool that I'd like to demo for you. And the tool is called Fusile. And it's a command line tool. I will tell it, this is my source directory. And I will tell it, would you please create a directory for me called dev? So before I do this, you can see that there is no directory here called dev. When I don't run the command, it tells me, I've loaded some transpilers for you. I've loaded Babel. I've loaded NodeSAS. The reason why it's done that is because I have those in my node modules. And you will see that now there is a directory here with kind of a weird file size uh, summary uh, that doesn't quite make sense, but it's called dev. And uh, if you see the tree of my source files and compare it with the tree of my dev files, they look kind of similar, right? The, these contain pretty much the same files, except for one difference. In my source directory, it's called main.scss. 
And in my target directory, in my dev directory, it's called main.css. So what does that mean? Did it, what did it do? And I can show you what it did. It actually compiled the SAS for me immediately. And what I just did here was I consumed this file using a file system API. I just used the cat command. And on demand, it compiled my SAS for me. It uses the color variable. It applied auto prefixing. And it has source mapping. And if I open this uh, awesome web page again, you can see that it is hot pink. And it has the rotation. And everything is pretty awesome. And this doesn't only work for, uh, for SAS. It also works for, uh, I should probably see the source here. I have a hello world JSX file, which is an ES6 uh, syntax file. And I can show you the, uh, the output of that when I read it from the dev directory. And it has compiled it into ECMAScript 5. This is pretty cool. And all I did was run this one command line tool, no configuration, and it does the right thing for me. So the project is called Fusile. Um, it has the same properties of the Express middleware that I went through before, but it also checks, uh, checks the two other boxes, I think, which is it has a good API, a file system API. Any other tool can consume this, be it your linter, your tester, your web server. You don't even need a web server, that, server that's clever anymore. You can use a Python static web server or Apache or whatever. It doesn't need to be specific for your application. And it's standalone. And it doesn't, well, it does impose Node as an ecosystem, but that's because I only know to program Node. If any of you knows how to write this in C, come poke me, then we can do that. Behind the scenes, it's using a, a, a library called Fuse, which is file system in user space. So it's actually just mounting this uh, virtual directory. And when I read the files, I can intercept these things just like the middleware, and I can do work to them. And inside, it's a very basic streaming pipeline, like you would set up in Gulp uh, if you do transpiling. So it's an open source project. It is uh, publicly available, and it is on NPM. It's in version 1. 03 or something. It's not entirely well tested, but it is definitely development ready. So I would love for you to go in and try this out and see if uh, you can make it work for your setup. I'm definitely gonna, gonna make this work on my work setup because I want this tool to succeed, or at least the idea to succeed. Um, so look this up, give me some feedback, and chat me up in the break, and, and I can tell you more about it. But I want to leave you with this. This is not only about this single tool. right? This is about the concept of tools. I want you to remember that tools are there to provide ability. And you should reject any complexity that they add, or at least question it all the time. And you should demand simplicity. This is what tooling is all about. So I think you should look through your tech stack, see what things do you have that actually don't give you any benefits, figure out how they can be improved. If you can't do it yourself, ask on Twitter. Like, I have this problem. How can we improve it? I think this is the way we can move tooling forward. I would really like to give the next generation of web developers a more easy starting point than we had. And I don't want anybody to mess with the amount of configuration that it takes currently to set this up manually. My slides are available here. Uh, you can still follow me on Twitter here. And I occasionally blog on this URL. And I want to thank you for listening to me.